the biggest winners, some of the most explosive in a positive way situations were kind of these lightning in a bottle stocks. And they had kind of had three primary components. Number one, they started when they were small, you know, and so they were micro caps. Many of them were sub hundred million market caps. And the reason for that is, you know, small, great businesses, there's a discovery process. First, retail investors discover the company first because they're the only ones that have a small enough amount of capital that can acquire the shares because these companies are so illiquid. And you, when you're looking at a sub hundred million dollar company, you're in that first part of the discovery process of the great company. And so that's why being small matters. Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host today, Clay Fink, and we have a very special episode teed up for the listeners today as I'm joined by Ian Castle. Ian, it's great to have you back. Hey, thanks for having me back. I really enjoy coming on here and uh, getting to know you a little bit more too through the process. Ian, I wanted to start by mentioning one of my very favorite investment books, which is a book by Gautam Bade titled The Joys of Compounding. When I read that book, I couldn't help but notice that Gautam highlighted you in the importance of networking and the importance of compounding goodwill by sharing with others. Could you talk about the role that networking has played in your own life and your own investment journey? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I, I remember, I think Gautam came to our Microcap Club event back when it was in person. It was, so it's probably like 2018, maybe. And I got to know him really well and got to know his life story really well, which is an amazing life story, kind of what he's built himself out of. It's, it's pretty incredible. And his book's a great one as well. So I'm flattered that he mentioned me even once in it. Um, but I think networking is probably one of the most important things that, that we do as humans, you know, not only through investing in business, but also life. And but kind of sticking to, to investing, you know, as a stock picker matures, you know, your edge goes from kind of only being analytical or you have a slight difference in your strategy. Um, then it develops into a relational edge, I feel you know, your ability to get to the the truth on a stock very quickly, you know, is really, really important when you know who to go to or on a, with a certain question, whether it's on the company specifically or an industry question, you know, that's a huge advantage, you know, and, you know, finding the truth quickly is an advantage of building out your, your network. Um, and for me, you know, it's one of the reasons Microcap Club Kind of was started back in 2011. It was one of the two core reasons. Number one, you know, launched Microcap Club in 2011 to be sort of an idea generator. I wanted to see what the smartest investors in my niche of investing, which is microcaps, what they liked and why. But second, it, it is it really kind of supercharged the ability to build out an investor network. You know, because you can see what other people like, and you can communicate with them internally on our platform. And so, you know. Just building out a network for investing purposes, you know, can be huge. Um, but kind of getting off the the microcap club soapbox for a bit, you know, you have to be proactive building that investor network. You know, you can't just sit back and expect people to to come into your um, to your line of sight and get to know you relationally. Like you have to be proactive with it. And so, you know, I think it's really important for, and that's why I tell young investors too. It's like get out there and showcase yourself. You know, start a blog um, present more, you know, just let people see you, let people see your potential. Um, and I'm a big believer that, you know, you really need to kind of supercharge serendipity, you know, a little bit, and you just have to be proactive in, in letting people know that, that you exist. And, and even when it comes down strictly on investing, I mean, there's just like simple things that you can do, such as when you're, um, write an idea and then you like an idea, there's probably a bunch of other folks that like that idea. Well, you can search Twitter, you can search the Google and you can just form connections that way by, you know, reaching out to that individual that wrote on that idea and just getting to know them, sharing, you know, collaborating, reciprocating. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think over time, you know, it goes well beyond, you know, just networking with investors. I think it's also the, you start networking with management teams and you've built management team relationships over not just years, but decades. You've built relationships with experts that you've gone to, to get advice on different industry dynamics or strategy of some of the companies you're looking in. All these people, you know, you hopefully had a positive past experience with, 
you know, hopefully you added value to them. So they see value in you, you know, and the, the ultimate goal, I think for any kind of stock picker, and I think if you've talked to any successful stock picker, that's been investing for, you know, over a decade, they would say that their personal network of investors and their personal network of relationships is probably their greatest asset. Um, but I think, you know, the, probably the high point of anybody's kind of network or relationships is when you are that first call that they make, you know, somebody in your network reaches out to you and shows you an idea. And that's when you know, know you've made it, you know, when your network pulls you into great situations because you, they value your involvement. You know, I think that's the sort of the goal of anybody. Mm -hmm. And you've once said that, you know, one of the people in your own network, one of your mentors, actually, he over his lifetime, he grew his portfolio from $100,000 to tens of millions of dollars by focusing on micro caps. Mm -hmm. And he did this all in just a span of like 20 years. And he's working a full time job just to keep busy just because he loved stock investing so much and he didn't want it to consume all of his time. Could you talk more about the role of mentors and how that's kind of played into your development as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I had two kind of primary mentors. And the first one, and the one that you mentioned was the second one in chronological order. The first one I had was a gentleman I met on a, a public stock message board back in the early 2000s. And um, he was a prolific stock picker, a conviction investor. And he kind of really helped me kind of set the groundwork even for kind of my current strategy of being a pure kind of purist stock picker, concentrated conviction, quality focused, talk to management, you know, all of those things he kind of drilled down in me. And he's also the one, quite honestly, who was also a story stock investor. You know, he's the one where the story, you know, was important, you know, to him. And, uh, you know, he was, he was a professional, not a professional. He was a certainly was a professional. He was a full-time gambler, basically, you know, and he lived in Las Vegas and he had this larger than life kind of personality, larger than life life and larger than life kind of radio announcer voice. I mean, he used to actually train brokers for 25 years for a brokerage firm. And so you can just figure out like he's had this type A personality and he kind of had, you know, probably got an A plus in Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people. He's one of those per personalities you would like right away. Um, and he was, and one of my first trips to go visit him is when I was an undergrad, when I got to meet him for the first time was, you know, he literally just kind of showed me the ropes of how he communicates with management teams. He, you know, sh just showed me a lot of different things. Um, and so for the, probably for the next five years, we, we got to know each other even more and more. We started investing kind of together in the same types of ideas. We started going and doing due diligence trips together to visit management teams um, and then probably five or six years after that, we kind of got separated a little bit because he kind of was remained a story stock investor and I kind of evolved out of, of that arena. And then I met, um, the gentleman that you mentioned, and it actually occurred on a blog post that I wrote on microcap club. This would have been probably back in 2014. Um, he just reached out randomly and just kind of explained a little bit about who he was and we just started emailing back and forth and we finally jumped on the phone together. And, and here, here he was, this, this gentleman that had a normal full-time job that built a portfolio, you know, from, you know, hundred thousand dollars in the early nineties to middle of 2014, I think it was around 50 million. And, uh, it was all in concentrated micro cap and small cap stocks, you know, and he still lived in the same $300,000 house, still had the same friends, still had the same everything. And you would never know it. You know, he's just a genuinely good human being. And, uh, you know, and for me at that point in time, you know, my previous mentor, the gentleman I mentioned, you know, he was really good at investing, but he certainly didn't have the best life. You know, he was literally larger than life. I mean, he gambled every day. He always had two 20 something blondes on each arm, you know, and that looks great from the surface looking in. But when you're around that for more than 24 hours, it gets, it's just it gets unattractive. You know, it's just, uh, and he kind of lived his life that way. Um, but this gentleman kind of lived the life that I wanted to live. And he also kind of showed me that you could grow a small amount of capital into a significant amount of capital focusing on concentrated you know, micro caps and be a, you know, great human being at the same time. And so 
you know, both those individuals, um, you know, were really paramount in my development, you know, as an investor. Mm -hmm. You've also talked about uh, finding the right mentor. You know, we talk about Warren Buffett a lot on the show, but in reality, Buffett is sort of in his own league. He's managing just massive amounts of money. He's looking at a totally different pool than a lot of other investors, including yourself. And, you know, his mindset, honestly, is probably a lot different than a lot of other people. And, you know, he's in a totally different kind of situation in his life. What advice would you give to someone, you know, wanting to look for and connect with and develop relationships with a mentor? Yeah, it's a, it's a question I like to ask people too, is like who their mentors are. And, and, you know, a lot of people mention Buffett or Munger or these, these people that are on like the Mount Rushmore of investing, but they don't really have a personal relationship with them. And that's what I really mean by mentor, you know? And so I know when I think of a mentor, it is, you know, kind of look out 10 years and visualize who you want to be, you know, not a hundred years or not $5 billion of net worth later. But look out 10 years, visualize who you want to be, then go find that person today and learn from them. You know, but one of the things I learned with my first mentor is the way you attract a mentor is to show value to them first. You can't just reach out to somebody and be like, you know, tell me everything you know. You know, my first mentor that I had that I met on a public message board, I tried, I think I emailed him or messaged him on that public message board five or six times and didn't get a reaction from him. It was only after I decided to be more proactive and actually do a lot of work into one of his investments and dig into it and get some exclusive public information that I knew that he probably didn't have. And I actually posted that on the message board that I knew he was watching, that I kind of pulled him in to want to connect with me. You know, I, you had to show value to, to that person before they would reciprocate. And, you know, I, I, I think that's important for anybody looking for a mentor is, you know, there's find a unique way to show value to the person that you admire that you would like to, to learn from. And what, you, what you're ultimately doing when you do this is you're reminding that mentor of themselves, you know, and if they're a good person, they will be intrigued by that and they'll want to get closer to you and see you succeed as well. And so they'll start reciprocating a little bit to you. And that's how, how relationships start, the good ones. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I'd like to transition now to chat more about investing and more so your process. You've researched microcaps for over 20 years now. And I'm curious what sort of changes you've seen develop over the years and how you've had to adapt to, you know, the changing investment landscape. Yeah, I would say, you know, the biggest thing that I've changed that I've noticed over the last 20 years is it's becoming more and more important for microcap investors, at least here in the US, specifically to be more global, you know, in their approach. And, you know, it's, and it's true. And the reason for that is here in the US, at least, there are less small companies going public as small companies. I mean, yes, you'll always have, you know, maybe 50 companies doing a 10 million or $20 million IPO that are trying to raise money for a phase one or phase two trial for a life science company. But I'm talking about, you know, you, you don't see many real businesses going public small, at least here in the U S and, you know, a big reason for that, I think go down this rabbit trail, but a big reason for that is a lot of the stuff that occurred about 12 years ago. Um, one of the primary ways small companies went public is actually through reverse mergers. And it still is. And back in like even the late 2000s, like 2007, eight, nine, there would be 800 reverse mergers done a year. You know, when you, when you kind of baseline that up against, you know, 8,000 public companies in the US, 800 going public every year, that's a significant amount of inflow um, into the markets. And so what happened then was there was a bunch of fraudulent companies that went public, some China, China fraud companies that went public in 2000, 2011. And it really just... And then when, when it became known they were frauds, it kind of destroyed that method of going public for a lot of small companies because nobody wanted to be, a, be associated with a reverse merger. And so the amount of small companies going public, at least through a reverse merger, went from 800 per year down to 100 you know, per year. Um, and so I think that has a lot to do too with, you see a lot of headlines about there's less and less public companies in the US over the last you know, 10, 20 years. Um, what's not really talked about is the effect of the lack of reverse mergers has had, you know, um, because 
going from 800 down to 100 a year is a big, big difference. Um, and so I think it's important because of that, that a US microcap investor, you know, becomes more international and focused in the mid kind of 2010s, 2012, 13, 14, and we saw it a microcap club too, is you started to see a lot of US investors look north of the border into Canada, you know, because again, they have similar accounting rules, you know, they're just north of us, um, you know, they, they, you know, their filings are in English, you know, it's, it's a kind of an easy leap to make. And so starting like the mid 2010s, you saw a lot of US investors, including myself, start looking at Canada. And especially at that point in time in Canada, it's a mainly a resource centered focus for their investment base. There was a complete just lack of interest in non-resource small companies up there. And so you could find, you know, growing, you know, companies growing 30, 40% a year profitable trading at single digit PE multiples. You know, and so there was probably a two or three year window where you just had a flood of U.S. investors kind of going after those non-resource companies. And then you saw that ARP, ARP gap close, you know, as all of a sudden, all right, you know, after three or four years, they're kind of trading the same level as the U.S. microcaps. Then after that, you kind of saw a movement to Australia or Europe. Um, and that's primarily my focus, too. It's like, you know, I now look at my sandbox of investment is not just the US, but it's Canada, it's Australia, it's Europe, you know, because mainly in those other areas outside the US, they still have real businesses going public that are small. They still have $10 million IPOs of a company that's growing and profitable, you know, that goes public. Um, and so it's, that's the reason why it's important to be global. So it seems to me that the US companies are going public later. So there might be, you know, slim pickings in terms of quality businesses that are small. Mm -hmm. And the other piece that probably ties into this is valuation. Do you think it's both of those kind of pieces playing into, you know, ripe hunting grounds and, you know, the Canada's, Europe's and Australia's? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I mean, there is a misperception, I think. And, and you know, I, I want to be honest with people. Just because a company is small and the stock is illiquid doesn't mean it's undervalued. You know, there's plenty of illiquid, small microcap companies that are fairly valued or overvalued. You know, you still have to do some valuation work. Um, it's just that here in the U.S., you know, if I focus just on the U.S., I could still, I think, do very well just because there's the new ideas in the U.S. are mainly companies that have been around for 20 years as a small public company. A new management team takes over that business, provides a capital infusion kind of refocuses that business on a new area and it becomes almost like a new company. It's just in the, the old vehicle that was there before. And so you have all these transformations that are kind of the new companies kind of here in the U S and that's, pro that's predominantly what, you know, I, I'm looking at as well as kind of like an old idea that transforms into a new idea with a new management team. Um, and that's, that's primarily how it's, how it's different. I've been loving some of the pieces you've been writing lately. One of the most recent ones is titled Lightning in a Bottle. Talk about the three characteristics that you found that lead to you know, this uh, alchemy of lightning in a bottle. Yeah, no, it, it was a fun article to write. It's something that's been in the back of my mind for a couple of years. And the, the term kind of lighting in a bottle came from, um, it's actually called the, the Leiden jar, or the Leiden jar, which was... Uh, a scientist from the Netherlands invented the Leiden jar and I think in 1746, and it was basically kind of the first iteration of a capacitor, you know, a negative and positive um, charged kind of jar that was able to store electricity. That's mainly what it was. And a few years later, Benjamin Franklin caught wind of, of this Leiden jar and he acquired one somehow and he started using it in his experiments and in his famous kite experiment in 1752 we actually you know where he flew the kite with a key you know it's actually the the lightning hit the key went down you know the the wire into this lighting jar it's how he stored the electricity it's how he kind of proved that lightning was electricity and that innovation itself led to a whole bunch of innovations around electricity and so you kind of i just was kind of inspired by this idea of just kind of holding probably Earth's greatest phenomenon, which is lightning in, a, in the jar of your hands, you know? And so that's kind of where lightning in a bottle came from. And just through my experiences with investing, some of the, the biggest winners, some of the most explosive 
in a positive way. Situations were kind of these lightning in a bottle stocks. And they had kind of three primary components. Number one, they started when they were small, you know, and so they were micro caps. Many of them were sub 100 million market caps. And the reason for that is, you know, small, great businesses, there's a discovery process. First, retail investors discover the company first because they're the only ones that have a small enough amount of capital that can acquire the shares because these companies are so illiquid. So it's retail, it's smart retail finds them first, then institutions find them second, and then dumb retail buys them third, you know, on the back end of it. And you, when you're looking at a sub hundred million dollar company, you're in that first part of the discovery process of the great company. And so that's why being small matters. Um, the second part of that was a business with a, a high organic growth rate and or um, high operating leverage with the business. And the reason why that's important is pretty much anybody and everybody, including institutions, are attracted to high organic growth rates. And, and But it's also important that they're not cash burning companies. You got to find them that are profitable and or very close to profitability. And but the reason I like high organic growth rates as well is, you know, if you're buying them at a reasonable price, you know, your forward return should probably match the, the organic growth rate of the company. Um, you know, even if the multiple stays consistent over time. And so, you know, you have this unique business with a high organic growth rate. And then what I kind of like the jar part of it or the bottle part of it is, having few shares outstanding, the outstanding share count of the company kind of less than 20 million, preferably less than 10 million. And I'm a big fan of scarcity. And the reason why a, a company with a low outstanding share count is so attractive is just there's not very many shares available for anybody to even acquire, you know, the business. And so when somebody goes to buy the shares, they have nowhere to go but up. Um, and it's kind of similar to, I used a, kind of the comparison to Pablo Picasso, Pablo Picasso, produced, I think, 1900 original paintings during his lifetime, you know, and today he's probably the most famous artist like on the planet. And most of his paintings are owned by private um, art collectors and also museums. And only probably one or two or three come up for sale every year. And there's one or two or three go for tens of millions of dollars to over $100 million in value. And that's because of scarcity. There's just a lack of supply and unlimited demand. And that's the same thing with an illiquid stock, a company with few shares outstanding. And even if you want to take scarcity to another level, great businesses in general, you know, whether it's large cap or micro cap, great businesses trade at a premium because there's a scarcity value of them. There's not many of them that exist, you know, and that's why they trade where they do. And so that's also an element of scarcity that I find attractive. So when you combine all three of those things, small company, unique one of one business that has a high organic growth rate or a high operating leverage business, you know, combined with uh, just not very many shares outstanding, you know, it creates very explosive kind of earnings per share growth. And that's what I've seen over 20 years is it's those companies that can go from zero earnings per share to a dollar to $2 per share earnings per share in like one or two years that just captivates that mesmerizes the investor base and you, institutions are just drawn to them like a moth to a flame, you know, and that's where you get 10 baggers, 20 baggers in a couple of years is from those situations. And so that's primarily what I wrote the article on is kind of drawing on some of my past experiences. Always wanted to talk about Benjamin Franklin and the kite experiment. So I kind of drew that into it as well. <laughs> the interesting piece about that, you know, it kind of caught me off guard is the, the share count. You know, there's a saying, it doesn't matter you know, how many different ways you slice a pizza, the value is, you know, what the value is of the business. But you make the important point that institutions don't want to buy what they, you know, many refer to as a penny stock. So if a stock's $10 instead of $1, you know, they, they may be flooding into the $10 stock, which I find just quite an interesting dynamic there. Yeah, that's more specific to the US, but here in the US, the term penny stock is defined as a stock that trades under $5. And sh so to have a stock that's over $5 is a big deal. You're kind of naturally at least uh, visible to larger pools of capital that can acquire your shares. So, you know, I think here in the US specifically, share structure is probably more important than in other areas like Australia, for example, where you can, <laughs> you can actually find companies that trade for five cents that have 4 billion shares outstanding, you know, that 
you know, basically a small cap that it's trades at four cents. It's actually not that odd, you know, but here in the U S it's a benefit to have few shares outstanding to have a higher stock price. Hmm. I wanted to transition to some of the content you guys have been putting out related to researching microcaps. You have what you call your FAIR framework, F-A-I-R. It stands for Find, Analyze, Interact, and Research. So starting with Find here, which relates to finding companies to then research and dig deeper on, what are the four ways investors typically find an investment? And I'm curious which of the four you have sourced the most ideas or which you put the most focus on. Sure. And no, I appreciate the question that, yeah, this is a presentation I've been meaning to do for a few years. I get asked quite a bit about, you know, where do I start kind of as a question, um, whether it's for subscribers that are kind of new to invest or new to micro caps. And I've always wanted to create some content around, okay, here's, here's at least a, a one hour presentation that it's free and you can search YouTube for any of the listeners. You can search a beginner's guide to researching microcap stocks and find it. But, you know, quick kind of like quick and dirty tutorial that gives you a baseline of knowledge on how to appropriately attack researching a microcap company. And, you know, you talked about, you mentioned the FAIR research method and the first uh, letter F in FAIR is find. And what I primarily have found is that uh, when it comes to finding companies, it's predominantly three ways, you know, and then there's kind of a fourth kind of umbrella way of doing it, you know, so it's kind of brute force, screening, networking, and then kind of this umbrella term would be curiosity, because I don't think you can do any of those three without a certain level of curiosity, wanting to find the truth and wanting to find something. But the first way is brute force. And, you know, kind of the key with brute force is the only way you know you weren't missing something is to look at everything. And, you know, Michael Liu and I recently did this uh, in the UK on the London AIM Exchange, which is sort of like their smaller NASDAQ version in London. And we literally went through a thousand public microcaps on the London Exchange, you know, A through Z, you know, and we actually try to do this every other year on the OTC markets here in the US, you know, literally go A through Z through the entire list, because that's the only way, you know, you don't miss anything. Um, and I also know other investors that literally look at every single press release of every company under a certain market cap. You know, it's the way they kind of spot something changing or something that could be actionable. Um, you also see a lot of different ways that people just kind of use this brute force and it sounds tedious, um, but it's all about trying to find those crumb pieces of what could be a promising investment, you know, basically. You know, the, the advantage of brute force is that few others are going to go through that effort. You know, just me saying this, people probably start to fall asleep thinking about going through a thousand companies. You know, it's just, it's not fun. It's not tedious. Yes, you too, Clay. <laughs> I wanted to ask, for brute force, how quickly do you d disqualify something? Is it five minutes? Is it an hour? Um, talk a little bit about that. You know, when you're going through it, a lot of times you can... You can take 10 seconds sometimes, you know, to go through it. And what you're doing is you're kind of going through that quick overview, those 10 second ones, dun, 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 you know, check them off or cross them out, I should say. Then anything that looks half interesting, you kind of like highlight. And then you go back through, you take that thousand down to 70. And then the ones that are half interesting, you might spend five minutes on. Well, you know, 80% of them go away. Now you're down to like 15. And then you might spend 15 minutes on those. And then, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it takes time, but it's not an inorbitate amount of time. It sounds worse than it is. And especially as you kind of grow as an investor and you gain experience and you know what you're looking for, it's easier to say no to things. Yeah. So I think brute force, again, you know, the, the pro is that you don't miss anything. The con is it's tedious. Uh, but I, I think that's also the advantage of brute force is because you're able to look through you know, this mountain of uninvestable ideas is sort of an advantage because few people will want to do that. Um, the next one would be that we talked about was screening. And, you know, there's a couple of different ways you can screen for companies and all screening is doing is you're taking the investment universe, you're plugging in some either financial parameters or some other parameter, and you're trying to take that ocean of stocks down to a pond. You know, that's kind of what screening is. And a lot of folks use more of a, I would say, um, 
targeted approach using mainly specific financial parameters. But the problem with that is there's a bunch of other investors doing that exact same thing. And so you're all staring at the same list of, you know, 30 companies because you're always, everyone's going to put in, well, I'm looking for something that's growing 30%, that has 80% plus gross margins, that has 20% operating margins, that has debt to equity of this or ROI of that. You know, you're staring at the same companies everybody else is. You're looking at a bunch of probably fairly valued to overvalued situations. Um, I like to use more comprehensive screens and Michael who works with me at uh, the funds that we manage I mean, he does a great job of this. I mean, one of the screens that we do is for insider buys over a certain amount and that's kind of globally. And the reason we like to do that is there's oftentimes we mentioned before in this interview, you know, here in the U S a lot of times it's an old situation where a new management team comes in, provides a capital infusion. And so that's triggering us to, potential transformation is when you're screening for large insider purchases. You know, if somebody's putting in in a small micro cap, a half a million dollars or more into a business, they obviously think that the stock's going to go up. Um, and so it doesn't mean that it will, but it, it's, it's enough to, to throw a spidey sense to go off that we should probably dive into this situation. And so that's, that's predominantly the type of screens that, that we do, you know, from that perspective. And then, you know, networking, we kind of already hit on before, but that, becomes less of an asset in the beginning of your maturity and then just keeps growing and probably 10 years into your building out your investor network it's by far the most important part of finding ideas is through that uh, investor network mm -hmm. jumping to analyze and the FAIR acronym here, you're pretty big on looking not only at a company's filings and their earnings calls, but you're also really big on diving into the non-traditional methods of doing research. You know, you want to understand the company better than anyone else out there practically. Can you talk a bit about how important that non-traditional side of your research is and which methods of non-traditional research have been most helpful for you? It's a good question. I mean, when it comes to analyzing, probably the first thing I do is look for red flags, you know, which are, which are important, you know, that you're trying to get to quick nose really quickly because it's the half of all public companies are micro caps. So there's not a lack of ideas. So you just want to get to a quick no. And so kind of the, the most prominent red flags for, for us as investors is, you know, past associations with fraud, you know, is number one. It's amazing how many investors and how many institutional investors don't put each management's name into Google with the word fraud and see what comes up. You know, it's uh, just simple stuff like that, which sounds insane. You're like, oh, of course I would do that. It's amazing how many people just don't do that. I mean, that's like number one. Um, number two is, you know, a small time auditor. So the company has an auditor that audits the financials that basically blesses the financials and you look into it and you realize they only audit one other public company. You know, it's also based out of Nevada or some, you know, or Boca Raton, Florida or something like that. No offense to Boca Raton. Um, the third thing is just a messy capital structure, just a lot of shares outstanding, kind of the opposite of what I was saying. We were talking about lightning in a bottle, you know, you know a lot of shares outstanding, different classes of shares, lots of warrants. You see a lot of self-dealing from the management, you know, repricing their options or whatever the case may be. That's a red flag. And then also another prominent one is just a lot of related party transactions, you know, where the management team is figuring out ways how to enrich themselves with self-dealing, you know, whether it's, um, you know, sale leasebacks with the company headquarters or, you know, we've even seen it quite a few times where, you know, the, the personal plane is paid for by the company that they use specifically for personal, you know, business mainly, you know, <laughs> just yeah. stuff like that. That's just red flags. And also it's one of the things that becomes less and less attractive as a quality focus investor is, is are those companies that have like large investor relations campaigns, you know, to really promote their stock uh, in different ways. And so the, those are kind of the red flags that we first do when we, when we analyze um, analyze micro cap companies is you're trying to get it to a quick no right away. And, you know, the things that really matter, and I think I mentioned I don't know, maybe six of these in that presentation, but um, the things that really matter are execution matters when you're looking at a company, you know, and so is what the company is saying and doing matching 
with the fundamentals of the company, you know, is the leadership obviously matters. And I spent a lot of time on the leadership side. I'm very quality focused, wrote, co-authored two books on intelligent fanaticism, uh, really trying to fine tune my lens for finding great leaders. Cause that's the key. I mean, to find great companies early, you got to find great leaders early. And so just fine tuning that qualitative lens. And so leadership matters to me, you know, skin in the game obviously matters. You know, do you see a team around this, um, the CEO, you know, in microcap, you see a lot of hustles, you know, companies that can go from zero to 10 million, you know, but the CEO is still wearing every hat and they don't ever kind of let go enough to bring in a team around them. So you see a lot of that culture matters. Are the employees happy? And we'll probably get into this later, but that's a big thing. Are customers happy or the balance sheet matters? You know, all these things matter. And so that's where you're just trying to figure out what the truth is using traditional or non-traditional ways of getting to what the truth is within these companies that might pass your immediate framework of, okay, this could be an attractive, you know, situation. Um, and so the, the way that you kind of dig in past just reading press releases, reading filings, you know, reading every interview the company has done is you're just going, I don't know, just do non-traditional matters. Like, you know, I think we mentioned like tracking company sales, you know, just looking at customer reviews of the products. Um, you can track customer movements, especially if it's a company that has customers that are also public. You can kind of dive into their, their earnings calls to see what the overall industry dynamic looks like, feels like. Uh, there's regulatory databases that you can pull down business reg records, UCC records. You can hire a private investigator to do background work into the management team to see if they are who they say they are, um, which is an interesting one to do, which is actually not as sound, might, that might sound insane, but it's actually, if you want to find out somebody about somebody really quick, that might be a good way to do it. You know, going to industry trade shows, which is something that Michael and I do quite a bit, is actually going to the large industry trade shows where our companies are presenting and just kind of milling around, talking to people, see what the buzz is, that type of thing. And also just reading industry publications. So that those are kind of some other, those are some non-traditional ways to, to do some, to analyze into the companies. I just wanted to jump in here and tell you about this new valuable resource that we created for you. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. If you're not satisfied with where you're at financially, whether that be not having enough savings at the end of each month, watching your cash being eroded away by inflation, or maybe you're not sure where to get started with investing, down in the description below, we put together a free guide for you called the four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can get this free guide by clicking the link in the description below. Turning to the interacting piece, I wanted to pull in this quote from you. 95% of due diligence is analyzing if customers and employees are happy and why. And your edge is that 95% of investors will not do this. If you want above average returns, you need to do what average investors aren't willing to do. So what does this interaction piece look like for you You know, when you're analyzing a business? This is quite interesting, I think. So I'm really curious what your interaction process looks like. Yeah, I mean, it, this kind of gets back to, you know, on the, it's on the ground due diligence is what it, really what interacting means. And that can take a variety of forms, but it's kind of going back to the Phil Fisher, you know, scuttlebutt research kind of method. And, and it kind of, you attack this as a way to verify what the company is saying, you know, and really it's all about, like I said before, multiple times, it's about just finding the truth of the situation. And so what, what normally this looks like from our perspective is, you know, we, re we reach out after we do kind of a mountain of work. And that's something else I agree with Phil Fisher is, you know, we don't really reach out to the management team until the business itself was attractive enough for us to be willing to reach out to the management team, you know, and we don't reach out to them until quite honestly, we're probably, you know, 60, 70% of our way to a buy decision, you know, because you don't really know what the right questions are to ask of the management team until you've done that type of work, you know, because you don't want to, you don't want to waste their time either. You know, it's kind of obvious when somebody 
doesn't know you know the basics of a business and they don't find that attractive you're trying to build a relationship with these management teams getting back to networking relationships and so you want to always put in that front end work and we're not there to waste a company's time um and so what it normally looks like is a lot of front end work and a lot of that front end work could be even talking to some of the customers even talking to some of the employees um, through expert calls and things like that, that you can set up to, to get a sense of what reality is, even before even talking to the management team. And, you know, it's just amazing to me how many people don't actually talk to customers and talk to employees before they invest to, to basically verify that what the company is doing and saying, you know, is actually reality. And so that's who you talk to can change company to company. Uh, depending on what the importance is, but predominantly, you know, for us, it's talking to employees, talking to customers, talking to potential partners or partners they used to have. I mean, through expert next work, networks like Tegas and other places, you can talk to ex employees, which is always always a good thing to talk to. You you kind of already know they have a negative bent because they're an ex employee, but you can. It's a good way to uncover some things that you might not know about. The other part of interacting which is really helpful for investing is just simply talking to another investor that has owned that company for a long period of time. Because oftentimes they have a knowledge level into the business, into the management team that, that it would take you years to get that amount of information. So we like to reach out to, to kind of known longer term investors in it to get a sense of reality. And usually if they're in it for two, three, four years, they're not there to BS you. I mean, they'll tell you the good, bad, and different, you know, before you go into the conversation with the management. Mm -hmm. How do you get, you know, parties like employees and business partners interested in chatting with you and answering questions about the company? It's amazing, you know, what people like to talk, you know, it's actually not that hard, you know, yeah. and, it, and it's actually going to industry events too. What we found is like just going to an industry event and the company might have 10 employees. there just manning the booth. They don't know what they should say or not say, you know, like they're just there to happy to talk to somebody that's interested in their product or company. You know, and so that's a, that's a great place just to meet employees. Um, we do a lot of company visits. And so a lot of times, you know, well, I got to go use the bathroom and I'll like, you know, veer off here and ask, a, <laughs> poke my head into somebody's, you know, so you, you have to be a little bit creative. But what I found is it's actually easier to talk to employees and find, you have to be creative in how you do so. But um, they're usually very receptive in talking. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll mention though, and I probably should have mentioned earlier is, we're not looking to find insider information. You know, we're looking to find kind of public exclusive kind of information. Um, and there, those are two important distinctions. Yeah. Yeah. What is the distinction there between something that's insider information that only, you know, executives would know and something that it's, is more so public? I would say, you know, talking to mainly just talking to employees, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, they're going to say whether they like or don't like working there, you know, favorite question of mine is kind of like, well, you know, if you got offered $2 an hour or more across the street, would you move? You know, it's a good question to find out if there's a culture there, you know, because a lot of people, you know, if they really love to work somewhere, if somebody throws another dollar an hour at them, they're not going to move. And so, you know, things like that, I mean, you're fine to, to ask. We're not, even when we talk to management, we're not interested in guidance. Um, we're interested in where, what is their five-year strategy? Um, Management teams are willing to talk about strategy. They're not willing to talk about what are you going to do next year? Mm -hmm. Another sort of quote I pulled from that presentation you guys did that I absolutely loved is if the business situation isn't really exceptional, then you don't go any further. And I just really like that, how, you know, you're really strict on, you know, knowing what you want to find and knowing what you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something um, that's probably something I haven't really gravitated the most to until probably the last five years. I mean, I think as investors, we all overemphasize certain areas given our maturation as an investor. So most people start out investing as value investors. So they're just, you know, fundamentals, cheap stocks, book value, you know, you're overemphasizing. And then you kind of like start caring about the qualitative aspects of investing. You know, I want to find an outsider. I want to find an intelligent fanatic. You know, I'm going to find somebody that can, you know, that basically runs a billion dollar company out of a strip mall that pays themselves nothing that buys stock every month. You know, it's like these, 
these sort of uh, this, uh, you have this vision of this gritty kind of entrepreneur and you kind of over, can overemphasize that because you start like being so attracted to the quality of that individual it overshadows the actual businesses, business they're overseeing. Um, you know, and so I think kind of your maturation as an investor, you tend to overemphasize whatever you're, you're learning about and getting better at. And so it's important to kind of step back and view investing that, you know, business comes first, you know, the people obviously are a close second, but I want the business qualities to attract me into it because oftentimes those business qualities are also the result of a good operator there. Mm -hmm. The last point in your FAIR method is research with an emphasis on the RE, which essentially means continuing your due diligence after you purchase shares or also referred to as maintenance due diligence. Talk to us about maintenance due diligence. I think maintenance due diligence is the most important part of any conviction investor. Because when you think about it, you know, you're doing a lot of front end work before you make an investment. But it shouldn't stop there because these companies are evolving, you know, as soon as you make that investment decision, especially a small company. I mean, they're they're kind of like teenagers. They're going to you don't really know how they're going to turn out. You have an idea, you know, but you kind of have to watch them. And so the maintenance due diligence um, and research is really important, I think, for micro cap and small cap investors, just because these companies are small and they're evolving. And quite honestly, most times they're not going to evolve in good ways. It's going to be bad ways. And so a lot of the, the maintenance due diligence is the same type of work you're doing when you're making your initial investment. It might be it might be reaching back out to that expert or contact. It might be continuing to have those conversations with, with management over time. The ability to, I know a big thing for me is we're pretty high touch, you know, with our management teams, you know, and so just the ability to kind of journal and kind of keep track of how they answer questions, even their tone during a conversation. That's something I learned probably 12, 15 years ago is just the repetition of talking to management can be a huge advantage because you can just spot the changes in just a tone difference with a, a management team over time. Um, and a lot of times it's those subtle, soft cues that, you know, looking back, you realize, yeah, 99% of the time I should probably have sold that, you know, when I just sensed that something was off. And you don't have that until, unless you're putting in those consistent reps, you know, on the qualitative side. And so a big part of the the maintenance due diligence is continuing to have those qualitative relationships, whether it's with the management team, whether it's with experts that you've used before, kind of getting an idea on how the industry is tracking, how strategy is changing, how competitors might be entering the market, and just realizing that microcap investing will never be coffee canned. You know, it's not a coffee can type of thing. I mean, if you want to go broke, you'll coffee can a bunch of microcap companies. I mean, I think I know what I'm doing and I've been doing it for a long time. And if you were to ask me, you know, how many of the companies that I owned five years ago do I own today? Or how many companies have I owned over the last five years? I probably have owned, you know, 40, 50 companies and I probably owned three, you know, from that period of time. So that kind of shows you, you know, this is a higher turnover type proposition. You have, you're trying to find, I go into every purchase with the intention to hold forever, but very few companies will earn that right. You know, and so it's, you know, you want to continue to own the companies that execute over time. You let them get into bigger portions, bigger positions of your portfolio, and they've earned that right when they go up. And you're, it's kind of like a, a major league baseball team where you're always scouting for younger talent. You know, you'll bring somebody up from the minors to play. You put them in a game time position. They'll either succeed or not succeed. If they don't, you boot them back down. You know, and that's kind of what my portfolio looks like. It's concentrated, but there's a lot of activity under the surface in the smaller positions because I'm trying to find that next breed of veterans that will deserve that playing time and become a larger part of the portfolio. Related to the maintenance due diligence, I think that one of the most difficult parts of the overall investing strategy is thinking about a company that's growing at a relatively fast pace. And once that growth I think you referred to it as a company has a hiccup or has a misstep or earnings miss, then the stock can really get punished when, you know, a bunch of these momentum investors and a bunch of these traders just kind of bail on it. And a lot of the tourists are gone. And 
you've talked about in the past how you want to be able to sense when that growth is going to slow and get out you know before the stock gets punished so i i'd imagine that's that has to be one of the most difficult parts of it oh it, it is that's it's very difficult because every one of these companies that especially the successful ones you know, we talk about bull and bear markets in the macro economy, but each one of these companies has a bull and bear market in it, even within that construct of a macro bull and bear market. So like each one of these companies will, you know, go, you know, go up into the right and then they fall 30 to 50%, you know, and they usually investors in the winners, usually the expectations get too high. They stub their toe, they come back down, fundamentals backfill into a lower valuation, old shareholders leave, new shareholders enter, start over again. And you go make a new high, same thing. Eventually, two years later, they stub their toe, come back. But over time, you know, so kind of like it just looks like this. Um, and just being aware of the type of investor that you are. Like, do you want to try to play the game of trying to pick tops and take 20 or 30% of your position off the table? Or do you believe in the five-year, 10-year trajectory of the business and you're not going to waste your time trying to trade in and out of a portion of your portfolio? Are you better off using that time to find another one? Um, and so those are all very personal questions that, you know, the right way for me to do it might be the wrong way for you to do it, you know, and vice versa. That's something where you have to figure out your own temperament, kind of your own principles with investing and, and figure out a way that, that feels right for you. Because I know people that do it successfully either way. Mm hmm. During one of your previous conversations with Trey on the show, you had mentioned that you wanted four things in a company. It's a company that's positioned to grow during a recession as a strong balance sheet, intelligent management, and an attractive valuation. And I also remember how you talked about your portfolio during the great financial crisis. I believe you mentioned you had three holdings. Two of them didn't fare so well through the crisis, but the third one happened to increase by 280% over that time period. So I'm curious how you go about assessing whether a company is positioned to grow during recessionary periods. You know, the term of kind of finding a business that can grow through a recession, you know, probably gets some people to roll their eyes. Like that's like the Holy grail, or that's, you know, some unicorn that'll never be captured or something. But, you know, I, I first came about actually just, I think five or six years ago, I was talking to an investor and they were complaining about the macro market or, or something like that. And I said, well, all you have to do is find a business that can grow through a recession. We both kind of laughed and chuckled. Um, and then I, then I started thinking about it more. I was like, well, that's actually exactly kind of what I did through the GFC in 2008 and nine, you know, and, and that, that was a company and the company was Zag. Um, then I think it was acquired a couple of years ago, but you know, that was a company that was, you know, growing 50%, growing the bottom line, a hundred percent through that recession. And, you know, that wasn't some double long gold ETF or, you know, something like that, that you would expect to do well in a bad environment. That was a company selling a consumer product, a low price consumer product during a recessionary period where the overall markets went down 52%, that company went up 280%. And so to answer the question, how do you go about accessing if a company can grow through a recession? I think a good place to start is with a small company. Um, you know, if a company has a great product and, you know, it only has a small revenue base, it doesn't take a lot to grow it. You know, just take two or three customers to have that thing grow even through a bad period. And so I, I like the idea of investing in small companies in recessionary periods. And you also, a lot of the really, really good and interesting microcap companies dominate niche markets where they might sell their products into a niche year, into areas of the market that, you know, aren't cyclical, you know, and so you can find these smaller companies that it's kind of where not being global can benefit you, you know, either or not being diversified can help you, you know, in who they sell their products to if it's B2B. Um, so I think for me, you know, thinking about it that way, I've sort of gravitated to kind of looking for these qualitative elements in my investments. I like to combine kind of growth and survival, you know, together. And I think that's what forms quality. You know, you have growth investors that you know, we saw it in 2020, 2021, they just loved hyper growth and all they care about was growth. And you kind of have survival and you can kind of put that into the deep value or value camp of people that are just looking at balance sheet, what's trading up book value. You know, I like to combine those two elements. And I think that the combination of growth and survival equals quality. Um, and what I'm looking for just happens like right now I'm positioned pretty heavy in healthcare and mainly because 
I wasn't seeking to invest in healthcare. It's just that it's an area where you can find companies that have 80% gross profit margins, 30% operating margins, founder led. They have IP, so they have a moat around them. And oh, by the way, you know, people are going to still keep getting injured, need wounds healed, need surgeries done, whether it's elective or cosmetic, you know, they still need these procedures done and they, they'll still do well through a recessionary period. Uh, and so I've kind of found my ways, you know, probably half our book is into healthcare stocks. And it's mainly not like I look to be a healthcare investor. It's just that they're, they have the qualities of what I'm looking for, of something that can grow and survive. Mm -hmm. I remember messaging you once about a smaller company that was close to the microcap land. And it seemed like you almost immediately dismissed it because it didn't pass your test of being within the first wave of discovery. I'm curious, how did you come to appreciate this and value this so much? Well, I, I do remember that exchange. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, you mentioned a larger microcap company. And my reaction was basically that, you know, I wasn't that interested because, you know, it was a business that was already well identified and well loved by a bunch of quality focused investors that actually are more larger company focused, but they, it's a, it's, it was a well-known company and it's not to say that company is a bad opportunity. It's just one that wasn't for me. And I know that just because of how I invest. I like to, I like to be involved in the first wave of discovery and an idea. I like to be one of the first to understand the business. I like to be one of the first to form a relationship with management because um, that's my edge. I, you know, I don't have to be first, but I enjoy being one of the first. Um, and I find it's really important because that first wave discovery is what what normally takes one of these companies from being undervalued to fairly valued. So that first wave discovery is where that kind of that valuation gap can close. And that's probably the first 100 or 500% move in a stock. And, you know, the beauty of microcap investing is it, the, the, the beauty and the curse is that it only takes sometimes tens, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars to move a microcap millions of dollars in market cap, you know? And so in microcap discovery really matters. It's probably the only place in really the public markets where discovery matters, where you being one or two investors later can mean that situation, at least that easy money is gone, you know, that first discovery phase. And uh, so I enjoy being first to an idea or one of the first for that reason. I think, I think it's also the reason why I think that way is I'm generally more attracted to rising star companies. So you kind of have fallen angels and rising stars, mm -hmm. you know, and fallen angels are companies that were, let's just say they were the high flyers of the tech boom in 2021. They're the one or $2 billion market caps that are now sub hundred million dollars. They're the SPACs. They're these things that everybody's kind of picking through, trying to find that diamond in the rough of the dead. Um, and all these companies are down 70, 80% from their highs. And, you know, some people, a lot of people enjoy going through that. It's just not for me. Like all of those companies, they have, they're well known. They have five analysts covering them still. Most investors that know about them have been disappointed by them. A lot of investors have a reason to say no to that idea, you know, and that's just not who I am as an investor. I'd love, I'd love to find, you know, kind of rising star companies, like new ideas. I like to find them first. I like to find ones there. It's generally a new idea that no one's ever heard of, maybe even in the microcap ecosystem to where every new investor that hears that idea can be an incremental dollar. They don't have, that company hasn't had enough time to disappoint everyone yet. <laughs> if that makes sense, a cynical view of it. Um, so you have that tailwind of perception where in Fallen Angels, you have a headwind of perception. And so just for how I invest, I like to, find things first. I like to find new things first, if that makes any sense. Yeah. As you were saying that, I was just imagining, you know, the diamond and the rough analogy where you're the very first one that's finding it. And then when others discover it as the business fundamentals improve, then the stock naturally gets a boost. I'm also curious that given the micro cap land, it seems that you really, really need to understand the qualitative aspects of the business because you're doing the due diligence yourself, you're doing your own research. And given that you have, you know, thousands of companies to select from, and you have, you know, plenty of ways to generate new ideas, I'm curious what your thoughts are on how difficult it is to select the best ideas and how sort of 
valuation factors into that. You have your watch list and you have your current portfolio. Do the best opportunities really stand out to you or do you find it difficult to sort of sift through them? Well, I'll, I'll take a step back. Um, you know, I don't think microcap investing is a lot different, that too much different than other investment classes where you have thousands of options to put your capital. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it sounds like a Yogi Berra quote, but you know, to find something, you first need to know what you're looking for and you need to know who you are. You know, when you start out, you really don't know as when you start out as an investor, you really don't know what you're even looking for. You approach things as a sponge. Then over time, as you experience things, you soak up everything and you learn from reading and experience. And slowly but surely, you turn into a filter. You start filtering things out. And I actually started writing an article that I'll probably put out at some point this year, you know, on this topic of, of active patience. And I mentioned in an article a few years ago that I wrote. And, you know, I, I think it's, if I were to define active patience, it's knowing what you were looking for and not doing anything until you find it or it finds you. And I think you develop kind of active patience and the ability to find things quickly, you know, through this development of three steps. You know, you first have to develop your temperament as an investor, which means determining what flavor of investing aligns with your kind of natural inclinations so you can apply consistently and successfully over time. You know, what that's your temperament. You know, investing's greatest lessons can't be taught in a book or a classroom. They have to be experienced. So it just takes time to develop that really that temperament and the temperament is, you know, your views on risk, your time horizons, your position sizing, and all of those kind of, I don't know, broad pillars of investing, you know, then you have to develop your principles over top of that. Once you figure out kind of what type of investor you are, you know, it's really the principles of what guides you, you know, it took me 15 years to develop kind of my, my theories around those four attributes you mentioned earlier about growing through a recession, a balance sheet that can endure. I'm looking for intelligent fanatics. You know, I'm looking for evaluation that can hopefully double in three years, things like that. It took me 15 years to kind of develop that around scarcity, survival, tailwinds, discovery. That didn't happen overnight. You know, it took 15 years of investing with different types of management teams and CEOs, speaking to them, having dinner with them, truly knowing them until I started to see patterns in kind of their personality and character, that these are the types of people that I would align with, you know? And so it just takes time. And when you do all those things, when you know what your temperament is, when you know what your principles are, then you just need to apply those things consistently with commitment. Um, and, you know, just be fully committed to those because anything less, it's just, you're not going to be able to see it through to the end. That's why I don't get too hung up over a missed opportunity that I missed because it probably wasn't something that I would have been able to hold anyway if it went up. Um, so that's how you develop kind of this active patience. And when you do that over time, you can get really, really quick at saying no to an idea. And you can get really, really quick at saying yes, too. You know, there's been times where I can get to a yes in a few days because it just, you know, I'm not talking about I have to do six months of of work into a name and produce 200 pages of notes. Like the best idea is it's, it's, um, they kind of hit you or punch you in the face sometimes. And those are the ones that, those are the great ones. Cause that means they were meant for you, you know? Related to my question earlier regarding the maintenance due diligence, I'm curious if you could share an example of a company you sold and why you ended up making that decision. I'm more so interested in just like sort of the things you're looking for and the filters that you kind of go through and your holder sell decision. Yeah. I mean, I, no I normally sell for kind of four main reasons. You know, first is, you know, I find something better than my seventh best idea. Um, and that's probably the most, that's probably the thing that happens the most is you just find something that's better than your worst idea. And normally when that occurs, to replace something in the portfolio, I'm basically replacing a relationship that I trust, unless that company or that position is doing something wrong and I want to get rid of it anyway. You know, and so a new idea has to be better than anything I currently own, or at least I have to think that to replace anything. It's just like, you know, if you have a, you know, a lineup in baseball of 350 hitters, what's the point of adding one that bats 280? You know, and so you're always looking to raise the average with any new idea. So that's the first. The second one is, you know, probably the most common occurrence is it stops tracking to thesis. 
you know, you start to pick up on those clues that we talked about earlier, whether it's through management conversations or tone or your experts that you talk to, that something has changed and it just needs to be sold. And what I found over the years is every time that I've kind of my spidey sense has gone off and I've waited, that was a mistake. Um, Cause that's the great thing about, you know, maturity and experience too, is your gut feel that it's sort of a summation of all your senses and experiences it actually gets more and more accurate as you get older. And so, you know, every time that I, that spidey sense goes on, I usually listen to it. And that's, that's the tough thing about investing too, because you got to be willing to kind of marry, my, my wife hates this, but by the way, this, what I, when I say this, you have to be willing to marry these companies, but divorce them quickly, you know, when the story <laughs> changes. <laughs> and then, um, I guess another way would be, you know, the management team just does something dumb, which, you know, happens too often. Uh, and it just forces you to sell because that means you just can't trust them anymore. And then the fourth one is the best reason to sell. And that means something went up too far too fast, you know, where it's that lightning in the bottle that, you know, it went at 10 X, you know, in a period of a year or two. And it went from, you know, undervalued to being trading for perfection. And, you know, it's only a matter of time till it's going to pull back 50% or they stub their toe. And, uh, you know, that's the, that's a great time to sell. You know, and every time I waited on those, I wish I did because that 50% retrace always happens at some point. Mm -hmm. Something that really stands out to me throughout this conversation is you mentioned the spidey senses or almost going off your gut feeling. I can't remember if it was George Soros. Whenever he would have back pain, he knew he needed to yeah, make a change in his portfolio. And yesterday I was listening to your conversation with our friends, Toby Carlisle, Jake Taylor, and you were talking about the importance of journaling and reflecting. And I think that's a key part that sort of plays into this gut instinct of ingraining sort of these principles and ideas. And what's uh, really interests me with people that are as busy as you is sort of how they spend their time. How do they develop these processes to ensure they're doing things like journaling and reflecting? What does that look like for you? you know, where you're journaling and you're reflecting on your overall investment process, what your mistakes were, what your buy decision, what does the journaling process sort of look like for you? I try to do it every day in the morning, like the first thing I do with a cup of coffee, because that's usually when my kids are still asleep and I have time to do it before they get up and you try to get them out, out of the, out into school. Um, so usually that first hour of the day is when I journal either creatively for writing or thinking about investing. And I normally, you know, it's similar to, do you know who uh, Tony Deeden is? Yeah. Yeah. So he's a, he's a really cool investor. It's, I don't know his, I think he's only done one public interview. It's on YouTube. You can search mm -hmm. it. it has like a million views on it, but he, um, I decent friends with him and, you know, he, he goes sailing every summer for three months or something like that on his, on his sailing yacht. And uh, he, he was telling me, but just, he uses that to just think and he'll devote one week during the summer to just thinking about an idea, one of the investments they own and just kind of focus on it and come up with questions or um, things that could go wrong more or less that he might be missing. And yeah, that's sort of how I do it too, where I go through periods of, you know, two or three days where I just simply focus on one investment uh, because I'm usually having these constant repetitions with the management team. Uh, you know, maybe what's interesting about that too is like, I probably talk to management teams a lot more in the beginning because it takes me more time because you're trying to put in those relational reps with them. You're it's like dating, you know, and then all of a sudden, like once you actually trust them, and the only way you trust them is actually just like you do with your spouse or any relationship, living life together. You know, you have a bunch of shared experiences, the ups and downs. And then over time, you've seen them go through the downs and you can trust them in the downs, which means you can trust them in the ups. Um, and so you normally what happens is if, if it's a business that I own for two or three years or longer, I probably, you know, only talk to the CEO me once a quarter, you know, and probably that time is when he reaches out to me to ask advice on something or, you know, something like that. Um, so the actual relational reps get less the more you trust these businesses, what I find. Um, so it's probably consistently inconsistent, but I try to focus on each individual investment, at least focus on them a few days, every probably quarter. Uh, and then most of that time is spent every morning, the first hour of each day. Got it. Well, Ian, this 
was absolutely wonderful. Really appreciate you joining us on the show again. Hopefully we can do it again someday. Yeah, I'd love that. Before we close it out, as always, we want to give you the opportunity to give the handoff to any resources you'd like. Of course, Microcap Club, your Twitter, and anything else, your blog. Yeah, no, I, people can find me on Twitter. My name is my handle on Twitter. You can find me on Microcap Club. I still post regularly on there, as well as 300 of the smartest microcap investors on the planet. Um, you, can, you can find me on microcapclub.com. And yeah, I mean, I think microcap investing, it's not for everybody. It's not without risks, but I think it's an area of the market that is underdeveloped and underappreciated given the fact that most of the best investors of all time started in microcaps. Most of the best performing companies ever came out of the microcap ecosystem. And I think 83% of the best performing stocks in the last 10 years have came out of the microcap ecosystem. So it's a vetted investment landscape, but you just have to be willing to lose money when you start, you know, because that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. So thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ian. Yeah, there's just a lot of microcaps out there. You know, it's 55% of all public companies in the US. It's 70% of all public companies in Canada and similar percentages around the globe. And most people haven't heard about any single one of these companies, but they have a big influence, you know, over the economy, you know, over everything. 